artwork that I will be talking about is Edward Munch's The Scream of Nature, also called The Shriek of Nature. Edward Munch was a Norwegian painter who lived from 1863 to 1944. His works were influenced mostly by Impressionism and Symbolism, but his works usually portray a certain emotion, so many of his works influenced Expressionism. There are four Scream of Nature works done by Munch. His first Scream of Nature was done in 1893 with tempera on cardboard. This particular piece is now in the National Gallery in Oslo. According to Amy Martin in her article, The Scream, by Edvard Munch, the 1895 version, done with pastel on cardboard, was sold on auction for $120 million, which makes it one of the most expensive pieces of art ever sold. Wow, you made four? What were the other two materials that he used? The second version of The Scream, done in the same year as the first, 1893, was done with crayon on cardboard, and the last one, done in 1910, was with tempera on board. Did Monk ever emphasize what inspired him? In his journal entry on January 22, 1892, Monk says, I was walking along the road with two friends. The sun set, and I felt a touch of melancholy. All at once, the sky became blood. I stood still and leaned against the railing, dead tired. Flaming clouds hung like blood and a sword above the blue-black fjord in, and the city. My friends went on. I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I felt as though a great unending scream was piercing through nature. The scream that Monk felt from nature must have been a very traumatic or memorable moment because of the time that lapsed since the last journal entry. He made his first painting of his experience a year later and continued on to make three more until his last one in 1910. That's 18 years since his journal entry. That's interesting. I wonder what caused him to experience such a phenomenon. The scream that Monk felt or heard must have been an incredibly deafening scream. His face looks as though he is filled with terror and is traumatized from the immense noise piercing through his ears and through nature. I'm wondering if the scream may have been from a vicious gust of wind or possibly the breathtaking colors of the sunset and his surroundings overwhelmed his senses. I'm wondering the same thing. The scream of nature is hard to wrap your mind around. It's not something we can literally hear or see, so I wonder what the experience was like for him. And also, he portrays the idea of fin de siècle because here he is bringing back the nostalgia and his feelings of exile. He is going through this traumatic event and his companions have no clue. The bright colors and warped lines in the painting also make the viewer feel disoriented. The rigidness of the bridge and his friends in the background emphasizes the fact that the people are on a different world than he is. Why does it seem to be that the background and scream are swirling but the rest of the scene seems to be unaffected? I think it gives the viewer a sense of what Monk was going through when he heard the scream. He was in such a state of terror and confusion that the world started to swirl around him and make him dizzy, while his friends in the distance were unaffected. And now we'll be talking about the great Renaissance man, Michelangelo. I'll be talking about Michelangelo's Pietà. The Pietà was created by the great Renaissance man known as Michelangelo, who lived from 1475 to 1564. What does Pietà mean? Pietà is actually not a specific term. Instead, it is a general phrase that refers to any image depicting this scene of the body of Jesus on Mary's lap after his crucifixion. When did he start the sculpture? Michelangelo started the sculpture in 1498 and completed it in 1499, and finished the sculpture when he was only 24. Wow, it only took him a year, and at 24 years old? It's amazing that he was so skillful and made this masterpiece at such a young age. Yeah. yeah, Michelangelo showed a lot of promise when he was young. He even went to formal schooling at the age of 13, which was very rare for artists in his time. The Pietà portrays Mary holding Christ's dead body in her arms. Michelangelo portrays physical naturalism by the way he details the bodies together, the interactions between them, and how they respond with each other. The realism that Michelangelo incorporates into the sculpture is absolutely amazing, especially considering that it is a sculpture and not just a painting. The Pietà was spawned from marble, but yet Michelangelo pays very close attention to the realism of the scene. Yes, it is very realistic. The marble cloth on Mary looks like real cloth. 
After Michelangelo had finished the Pietà, observers would give credit to other great sculptors. Because of this, Michelangelo inscribed his name onto a sash that runs across Mary's chest. The signature says, Michelangelo Buonarroti, Florentine, made this. He later regretted this decision of carving his name onto the sculpture because he felt that it was too prideful instead of an artist claiming his artwork as his own. After this, Michelangelo swore never to sign another work of art. I like this idea of him taking himself out of the art, even though he did create it. He only wants them to focus on the art and not the hands that created it. The hands that created it were very clever. The proportions of the bodies of Christ and Mary are actually completely inaccurate, but Michelangelo still figured out a way to trick the viewer. How did Michelangelo trick the viewer? An examination of each figure reveals that their proportions are not entirely natural in relation to the other. Although their heads are proportional, the Virgin's body is larger than Christ's body. She appears so large that if she stood up, she would likely tower over her son. The reason Michelangelo did this was probably because it was necessary so that the Virgin could support her son on her lap. Had her body been smaller, it might have been very difficult or awkward for her to have held an adult male as gracefully as she does. To assist in this matter, Michelangelo has amassed the garments on her lap into a sea of folded drapery to make her look larger. Another subtle detail of the Pietà is the hand placements of Mary. If you look closely, you'll see that Mary's right hand does not touch Christ's body directly as she holds him on her lap. The same goes for her left as it is suspended in the air, seemingly expressing some sort of emotion. That is a very interesting detail. Her hand does seem to portray some sort of emotion that is both sorrowful and graceful. But why don't Mary's hands touch Jesus directly? The reason she doesn't touch his body directly is to represent the holiness of Christ. And now we'll be looking at a work done by Lois Maylou Jones. And I will be talking about Lois Maylou Jones's The Ascent of Ethiopia, created in 1932. Lois Jones was born in Boston in 1905 and died in 1998. So throughout her life, she was able to see major changes in the generations of America. She started her art career from a very early age. Her parents saw her talent and encouraged her. She attended Boston High School of Practical Arts and studied in the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. What influenced her? Well, first of all, she started her career during the Harlem Renaissance, which was a new African-American culture in response to the Great Migration to urban areas such as New York. This is when jazz is taking root and Black artists such as Langston Hughes are surfacing to the top. In The Ascent of Ethiopia, Jones is using a narrative style to tell a story of the journey of African Americans creating their own culture in their newfound land of America. She shows their struggles and what they take pride in. There are multiple perspectives because they change with every period in time. There isn't just one place to focus on. She uses the elements of line color design in space. Jones isn't using the traditional styles of linear perspective or creating realistic space. You're right, it's not a realistic use of space, but more symbolic in its style. The first thing you see is the Egyptian goddess that takes one fourth of the painting. She returns back to Africa. For color, she uses a series of black and dark violet, while she opposes those colors with bright blue, green, white, and yellow. Those are very bright and contrasting colors. To me, these colors intensify the painting and the message that she is conveying. The message is saying, just keep climbing and you will reach your destiny. And this can be seen as a universal. There is definitely a very interesting mix of colors in this work of art. The bright colors symbolize uplifting hope for the African Americans. Wow, so even the colors are very symbolic in the message of this painting. So what exactly is going on in this painting? The lines are curvaceous, and they seem to move. Even the buildings aren't stagnant. She makes sure that the buildings are diagonal, as if they are dancing to the music. Yeah, I noticed that there are a lot of curves in this painting. Why is that? The curvaceous lines make the painting more intimate and personal. I can see that this subject and art is very important to her. She even goes on to incorporate the words drama, music, and art on the top. It gives this painting a sense of forever. Through the black figures, she progresses them through their body movements. They are the shadows of everyone that had to endure the climbing of the stairs. And from that, she evokes cultural identity. She is letting the viewer experience the climb. We can see that the ascent is not straight. It's interesting that you point that out. 
Why isn't the ascent just straight and easy? This is because they struggled under oppression. The stairs during slavery seemed to disappear, which could have meant a loss of hope, but they appear again. Furthermore, she is telling the future because we can see that the story isn't over and this newfound culture is just for now.